Hello and welcome to Micro Live. In tonight's programme, we'll be making a return visit to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where, amongst other things, they're using a network of advanced computer workstations to experiment with the educational software of tomorrow. But information networks have been around a lot longer than you might think, as Mac found out recently when Microlive went to the dogs. <laughs> At the racetrack, information is money. Hot tips, winners, the latest odds, all vital stuff for the serious punter. Before greyhound racing started in Britain 60 years ago, Bookmakers handled all the betting at racecourses. When dog tracks like this one at Haringey were built, the owners wanted a piece of the action. Luckily for them, in 1913, a New Zealander called Julius had invented a machine to mechanise the bookie's work. He could handle hundreds of bets a minute, he could work out and calculate the odds and display them. Well, the owners bought Julius's machine, and today it's still running and calculating their cut of the bets. Every time a bet was placed anywhere in the stadium, the odds on each dog had to be recalculated to take the new bet into account. Originally, 80 ticket machines passed details of bets down wires to a central processor behind this tote board, which recalculates and displays the odds on huge dials. Well, the best way to find out how it works is actually to place a bet. Every data processing system needs a way to input data. Today, we probably use a video display terminal but back in 1927, they used this, a ticket issuing machine. 20p on number six, please, for a win. Thank you. Well, a ticket is issued with the dog number and the race number stamped on it. It's an early form of hard copy. But you can keep checking on how much you're going to win from the tote board over there. The odds change every time a bet is placed, and the dials indicate the output of the totalizing machine. It's an equivalent of today's screen or data display. So a modern data processing system has inputs, usually keyboards, outputs, which can be screens or printers, and an electronic central processor. Whereas the tote has ticket machines for input, the tote board for output, and an electromechanical processor. Well, we're standing inside a gigantic adding machine. I suppose it's a 1920s version of a central processor. And every click you can hear is a piece of data being input. In this case, it's somebody down there in the stadium below placing a bet. These rotors are scanning the wires coming from the ticket machines, looking for the electrical pulse, which means a bet has been placed. Well, any pulse detected for a win bet are part of these accumulators which add up and display the total bets for each of the six dogs. My 20p bet on dog number six sent a pulse to this number six accumulator, where a solenoid releases a cog, adding one to the total bet on dog six. To get the odds for my dog, the machine has to divide the total amount of money bet on the race by the amount bet on my dog. This has to be recalculated every time there's a fresh bet. But this has to be done for all six dogs. Quite a tall order. Well, the answer was this amazing odds machine. The slope of these dials indicate the odds on each of the dogs. The way it works is this. The pointers run sliding pivots connected to the accumulators. One slider moves up as the race total increases. The other moves out with the dog total, altering the angle of the pointer. The angle of the pointer gives the odds. Well, this point hasn't moved out very far, which means people don't favour that dog. If you're betting it did win, you'd win quite a good return. But there's one down there that's moved a long way out, that's the favourite. If you bet on that, you wouldn't get a good return at all. Now, the angle of these pointers is linked to these dials up here, which show the actual odds for each of the individual dogs. The dials are then linked electrically to motors which drive the pointers on the tote board outside. The difference between this giant calculator and a modern computer is that modern computers have a program stored in memory, and this can be changed to do different tasks. The tote has no memory. Its mechanics are designed to do just one thing, calculate odds. And once each race is complete, the mechanics have to be reset manually. 
Sadly, the expense of employing the 130 people needed to run an electromechanical system means that most tracks are now computerized. Well, this machine is one of the last of its kind, and it performs its task today just as well as it did 60 years ago. But modern computers can handle more dogs, they can handle a wider variety of bets, and of course, they're much, much cheaper to maintain. So I suppose, like many other good things, its active days are numbered. This tote is not going to be a working machine for much longer, but it won't be scrapped. Doran Swade is the curator of computing at the Science Museum. Why is the Science Museum interested in the tote? Well, the Julius tote system is the earliest example of an online, real-time data processing and computing system that we've managed to identify. Um, the earliest example of this dates from 1919, and is located, in fact, in Australia. The system here at Herringay dates from 1928, and is the first example of its kind in this country. Um, one of the biggest difficulties we have at the Science Museum in explaining to people how electronic devices or computers work is that often what is of interest or of significance is often hidden or abstract. The beauty of this system is that it's entirely electromechanical, and what a device does is very often evident directly from what it looks like. Well, when you've got this at the Science Museum, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to make it work? Uh, an earlier system dating from 1933 was taken out of service at Wembley recently. Um, we acquired portions of this for the, for the computing collection at the Science Museum, and we hope to reassemble this as a working demonstration in the new gallery that's presently being planned. This system here at Herringay, when it's eventually taken out of commission, will not be run again. It'll be reserved for posterity, as it were, in the mathematics collection at the Science Museum. Well, that's a genuine winning ticket, 48p. I guess some people are just born lucky. Well, it makes a change to hear Mac sounding nostalgic for the good old mechanical days. Mind you, they'll be with us for a bit longer yet if this recent government report is anything to go by. It looks at the state of the UK research and development effort in science and technology, and it makes rather depressing reading. Morale is low in the scientific community. The academic community, subject to financial restraints and stagnant recruitment, is held back from breaking new ground. And it also goes on to say that in industry, pessimism is common also. Unfortunately, the rest of the world marches on, as Freff now reports. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Not long ago, this was a polluted, smog-ridden city. Heavy industries like coal and steel were the mainstays of its prosperity. But with the recession, that changed. The steel mills that once made this a hell on earth have now all but rusted away. Pittsburgh has had to find a new direction, and glamorous towers of corporate headquarters just aren't enough by themselves. Instead, it's research and development that are now vital to Pittsburgh's gleaming future. And just a few miles from the city center, is Pittsburgh's Carnegie Mellon University, CMU for short. MicroLive has come back to CMU to see how its investment in that information technology computing future has shaped up. Last year, we saw how their 6,000 students shared 4,000 terminals and workstations. Whatever course you studied, science, art, or humanities, you met the computer. One of CMU's newest facilities is housed just off campus. It's a research tool that doesn't come cheap and certainly isn't desk-sized. Wielding a financial stick out of reach of most universities and not a few national governments, CMU has attracted to Pittsburgh the supercomputer, the Cray XMP. This is it. Now, while it looks like an innocent piece of hotel lobby furniture, in actual fact, it's computing with the power of 30,000 IBM PCs all at once. Over the next five years, this unit will cost CMU $7 million, and in fact, an hour of computing time is $4,000. The reason it's this shape is that to make it compute so fast, the physical components have to be very close together, and you have to pump a lot of power into it, half a megawatt, which means there's tremendous waste heat. There are Freon tubes that run on either side of the circuit cards, and the copper plates draw off that heat into a room full of air conditioning. In fact, the Cray generates so much excess heat, they use it to warm the building. These machines are used for problems essentially in every field of science. Uh, engineering, uh, biology, social science, anything that requires large amounts of data. Engineering, people design structures, airframes, 
buildings, uh, electronic circuit boards. All right, all of those all of those items can be designed and simulated on machines of this class. Biologists want to study uh, the structure of complicated biologically active molecules. They can do it on machines of this sort. And if you're working on problems that take a lot of computing for your hour of thinking, you'd better have a big machine. This is brute force computing a huge, expensive machine tailored for raw number-crunching computations, not elegant software. Elsewhere on campus, artificial intelligence techniques and custom electronics are coming up with cray-beating designs. CMU's so-called high-tech is arguably the best chess-playing computer in the world. It's based on 64 identical custom chips, one per position on the board. Carl Ebling, high-tech's designer, has created these custom chips so that each is aware of any move that could bring a piece onto its square. That way, each of these chess processors can decide the best move for its square, and high-tech arbitrates on the best of these offerings. And the end result? A machine with a certain kind of personality. It has a style, and certain things it likes, and certain things it doesn't, and we keep giving it more information to try to broaden its style, I think. Is this really the best chess computer in the world, even against things like the Cray Blitz? Well, to date, we've beaten them once, and they beat us recently. But I think uh, I'm, I'm ready to bet $25,000 on a six-game match that we would beat them. Some research at CMU is funded by American industry, despite the fact that practical applications are years, perhaps even decades away. In this chemistry lab, they've created an organic logic switch, one of the building blocks of the so-called molecular computer. They use three lasers, yellow, green, and red, as input and output devices, focused on this vial. This is the switch, and inside it is a substance which exhibits a very special and useful kind of electron behavior. Semiconductor devices are currently reaching their limitations, and they're going to have to be replaced by some other device. IBM is predicting that molecular electronics will play a major role in the new generation of computers. Here's how it works. Two lasers are used for input, each of the lasers tuned to the wavelength of one of the molecule's branches. When the lasers fire, they cause electrons in the branches to be displaced. A single change won't trip the system, but if both lasers fire at the same time, electrons shift in both branches at once, causing the third branch to absorb electrons and change color. It's this color change detected by a third laser that is the output. To make these molecules, which act as the switch, requires thousands of repetitive stages. They use robots to cope with this. Making more complex circuits is another problem. Once you've got your molecule crafted, what do you do with it? Then we put it down on a very thin plate of quartz so that we can layer them, uh, make 1,000, 2,000 layers of them, and then they can be interrogated using lasers. The individual gates are 1,000 times smaller, and therefore electrons take 1,000 times less time to travel from the beginning to the end of a gate. It's simply a, a matter of size and speed. Why is IBM pouring so much money into this? Because molecular computers have the potential of being a thousand times faster than current semiconductor devices. And speed is a very important issue for the computer industry. Generally, the funded research is not much of a problem in the United States, in the sense that money from the government, and usually money from firms, is open-ended enough so that we can work on projects that we basically want to work on. And one such project is magneto-optics. This is part of the clean room at the Magnetic Technology Center. Now, rooms like this are normally used to make computer chips, but here it's the basis for research into new kinds of magnetic storage technology, bubble memories, megabyte floppies, and read-write optical disks. And around me, you see some of the tools of the trade. For example, they have a radio frequency sputtering system. That's a steal at $250,000. A plasma etcher. Cheap, $40,000. This is a leak detector. There's no price tag. Must have bought it used. A dual gun ion beam deposition system. That's back up, $350,000. And over here, we have a DC magnetron sputtering system, 100,000 or so. 
Add this gear together with all the rest in the center's room, it comes to four million dollars, and that's just to start the research. With the mass storage industry worth 35 billion dollars annually, this is an aspect of information technology that research just can't ignore. CMU's work in magneto-optical recording uses laser light to read, write, and overwrite information onto a compact disc in a modified commercial CD player. You can just erase and record and re-record and erase and just keep it going. Just you can like do that. There. You can do that over and over again. That's correct. It is. It's analogous to the the change from the long play record to the cassette, uh, the compact disc, which one knows for audio digital audio today. Uh, will in the future be able, one will be able to record and erase the information from that. Well, that's going to rattle a few windows. How's it work? Come on over here and I'll show you. They've developed a new storage material. It's magnetic, but can be altered by laser light. Over here we have a diode laser and it's uh, focused onto the small magnetic sample by the objective lens of the microscope. Mm -hmm. uh, on the TV screen, which is coming from this TV camera, uh, you can see little black dots appearing on the TV screen as the sample is stepped around by the microscope stage. Those, those little black dots are actually little regions of magnetization in which the magnetization direction has reversed. Uh, this was caused by the heat from the laser beam. In a uh, moment here, the array will be completed it will repeat the process, but we will selectively erase some of the domains from that. And we're getting a selective erase of various bits in the system. Okay. So those are zeros or ones? Right? Those are zeros or ones in a digital data storage system and, and could then be converted to music or video images or data for a computer. Last year on MicroLive, we saw how 4,000 workstations like these were being used all over campus. Good computers, but limited. They either timeshare on a mainframe, which is slow, or they operate standalone, which is fast, but by themselves they just don't have a lot of memory. We also saw a prototype of this advanced workstation, the computer that CMU had in mind for the network from the very beginning. It's what's called a 3M machine, a megabyte of onboard memory, a million pixels on the screen, and a processor that runs at a MIP, a million instructions per second. No more trade-offs, lots of speed and lots of memory. But its operating system was Unix, powerful and notoriously difficult to use. So they created a new user interface called Andrew, which simplifies things using windows, icons, and a mouse. CMU and 17 other American universities are betting that this machine and others like it will set the standard for academic workstations for years to come. Many in the industry, including one of the founders of popular computing, are showing great interest in this project. You've left Apple and your new company is dedicated to making workstations. That's your plan, but what do you think the market needs? I think very few people have ever come to this university environment and asked them what they wanted before. And the people that can best articulate what they need are the people that want here in the university environment that want these machines, that want to do things with them. So I think we've done an awful lot of listening in the last six months. and. Uh, are basing our plans on what they've told us. To be successful in a university, these workstations need to be programmed by anybody. And that's where a new software called CMU Tutor comes in. It's an attempt to make the power of these workstations accessible and available to non-expert programmers, especially professors who want to write educational materials, but other purposes too. These machines are very, very powerful indeed. And what that can mean is that you have to be very powerful to exploit them. What we've tried to do is encapsulate that power, tame it, let you rule its power. What features make it suitable for that job? Well, it supports all of the fancy text and graphics that these machines produce. Italic text, bold text, uh, drawings of various sorts, filling in areas, pop-up menus, uh, all of these kinds of things that are unique to the new world of personal computing are put under the control relatively easily and straightforwardly of someone who isn't really an expert in programming. Last month, the Inter-University Consortium for Educational Computing ran a series of one-week workshops for faculty and support staff from other universities to experience the new workstation environment and, through learning CMU Tutor, actually write programs for that environment. 
In less than a week, many of those participants, starting from zero, wrote significant, attractive, interactive graphics programs, especially with an educational bent. Now, we have some interesting examples of that, in fact, when, to show. When you say starting from zero, you mean from scratch. From They've scratch. They've never programmed before in their lives. <laughs> well, some of them had never seen a mouse or a large screen or pop-up windows or pop-up menus or any of these things. It was totally new to them. And yet they actually produced usable, interesting things. This program was written by Robert Souter at Vassar College. His purpose in this program was to give the students an idea of how the pressure on a cell wall affects its size as the concentration of a solution changes. The program starts out by offering the student a choice of theory or simulation. I will choose to look at a little bit of theory. And then after I've read the background for the program, I can choose to look at a simulation. When the simulation starts, the first thing I have to do is select some basic parameters for the process, which I will do. And after I've selected the parameters, I get a picture of the cell in a solution. And then I can watch as the concentration of the solution changes, the relative volume of the cell changes, and also I see a picture of the cell expanding as the concentration changes. Well, I think where you want to get to is where a history professor that's not a programmer, that's never used a computer before, or if so, only slightly, can sit down and construct a very powerful simulation for that particular history class they're teaching, and they can do it in an afternoon or a week, let's say a week. Um, and I think that's about three or four years away. I don't think we're going to see it next year or the year after. But one of the other things that we don't know is if you're going to try to take the history professor, say they want to build a simulation. Well, in order to build a simulation fast, you need a simulation builder program. In order to design a simulation builder program, what we have to do is get these machines out there and see what kind of simulations 100 people build and see what they all have in common and then build a simulation builder so that they can build those 100 simulations really fast. We haven't gone through that stage of seeing 100 people build simulations where it takes them three or four months and then try to extract out of that the common generic types of things that we can start to do automatically. So I think over the next year or two or three, we're going to be just getting this technology out to a lot of people. The uh, people that are willing to put in three or four months over, over a summer or over the course of a year with some students potentially that write these simulations will then be able to tell us via the, the, their results and, and verbally their experiences uh, the kind of tools we can give them to automate the process. But unfortunately, we have to go through that before we know. So what are we seeing on the screen, David? Well, we're seeing a map of the United States in 1850, which displays the rate of literacy or illiteracy in the population, that is, in the white, non-slave population. Now, uh, the light areas are the areas of, high, of low illiteracy, and the dark areas are the areas of high illiteracy. Uh, we can see this better if we pop up a particular region into uh, a pane of its own, and I choose from that menu, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, which comes up here. Deep South. The Deep South, of, uh, area uh, where there is uh, very high, uh, there's a band here of quite high literacy, uh, perhaps rather surprisingly. Now, if we choose another variable, like the percentage of slaves, remembering that uh, literacy and slaveholding in the society were both measures of affluence, we get a map here, which at first glance doesn't look like it matches too well. But uh, remember that in this utility, we can we can uh, manipulate the data, we can try to slice it differently. And if I do that here by a series of mouse clicks so that we're, we're uh, actually getting in this dark area, the areas, we'll get to see the areas that have really high slave holding, that is like over 50%, and that's coming up right now. Then I think you'll see that these, these two maps really have uh, uh, a very close relationship to each other. Now it takes just a moment and there it is. You see this light band of high literacy among whites and this band of very heavy slaveholding fit together really rather neatly. And that's a kind of an intuition uh, or kind of, uh, of uh, uh, way of being able to look at the data and manipulate it that we think is very potentially very useful both in teaching and in research applications. When things match up like that, it, it implies a kind of causal relationship. Isn't there a river along there? There's a river, the Mississippi River, and this is rich bottom land. This is where... A lot of farming, a lot of slaves. Where, exactly. What about the future of this as a research tool? Well, we're looking toward uh, 
research applications in which social scientists from a wide variety of disciplines can use not just maps of the United States, but maps of other parts of the world or, or more detailed maps of particular cities and explore data uh, in ways that they really never have been able to before. I think it's going to be a, uh, an investment of a lot of time and a certain amount of resources for us to learn this stuff, but we're not talking about uh, a trivial uh, use of those resources. I think we're talking about a very ambitious uh, and very what will be very rewarding uh, revolutionary direction in higher education. Something that will um, be the first real major shift in the way curriculum is delivered uh, since the 1960s. Surviving college requires a number of academic skills that not all students have, even if they think they do. Among the most vital are proper note-taking and writing, so at CMU's English department, they're developing software tools to help. Say you're reading a text or writing a paper, you're almost certainly going to have to take notes. So this system encourages you to do so in an organized fashion. Here's a laser printout of a typical screen. The text you're working on is in one window. Your notes are in other windows, one note per window, which you can open or close as you need. And a final window keeps track of all the notes in the paper. The system also forces you to keep references correctly. With this pop-up window, all you have to do is fill in the blanks. No more excuses. Even more interesting is an artificial intelligence program called Writer's Workbench. Now, Writer's Workbench takes what you write, analyzes it, detects a number of kinds of mistakes, and more importantly, makes suggestions for improvements in style. Here's a particularly regrettable piece of English we've typed in. There are caps in the wrong places. Constructions like rather unique, misspellings, quotes that open and never close, and split infinitives like have feared to boldly tread. Let's see what Writer's Workbench had to say about that. Well, it's caught the misspellings. It's caught the structural errors like the punctuation and quotation marks, the repeated word the, which we put in. But more than that, it's caught the split infinitive to boldly tread, and made suggestions, such as pointing out that I've got too many complex sentences, that they're all about the same length, that too many begin with the subject, and that I have too many passive verbs. It's made concrete suggestions for how I can improve my writing's clarity. Programs like this may or may not improve a student's performance. You do, after all, have to choose to take good advice. What's really critical is that these tools are under development and being rigorously tested. The rest of the academic world eagerly awaits the results. Education, in particular higher education, is a wonderful inflection point in society to introduce change. Uh, you've got very, very bright people uh, who are very eager to learn new things and uh, not necessarily adopt dogmatic solutions and who are going to carry those new ideas out to the world with them. Pittsburgh has pulled away from its old tech past. With CMU as its champion, its information technology future looks hopeful. Academic success coupled with business drive. Well, that's all for this week. Next week, we'll be looking at how the Mormons are asking us to use computers to search for our ancestors. And we'll be looking at the enormous benefits of computers in primary schools, but raising questions about the government's provision of resources and training. And so, until then... Good night.